Come on, sing it with me. My God isn't finished yet. If he did it before, he can do it again. So I trust him with what comes next. Cause my heart sights it. From the depths you have raised me To a height I have never seen Oh, you saw what I could be And now I know I'll never be the same And now your light is painting over, over me And all the colors of a master
here. This place is full of faith and belief and courage. Somebody make some Good morning to all our live church viewers, all our online viewers. We welcome all our viewers from all over the world. What a great day today to be able to come together like we are doing even in lockdown to worship God, to hear from His Word, to be inspired, to be redirected, to get our lives orientated to all that God has for us. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. So thank you for tuning in and let us know that you're online. Talk to us, chat to us. And uh, also if you want more information, you can contact us at info at life hyphenchurch.co.za. But stay connected. A couple of things that are coming up we want you to be aware of. Uh, just so excited about our Life Church uh, Academy. Uh, it's amazing. Life Academy is in a fantastic place where you can get yourself equipped, inspired. And next week, uh, Term 3 starts with two great new courses. And I want you to be aware we're going to be dealing with stress, depression, and anxiety. It's a great course. It's very important that you connect and understand how to deal with these things. But not only for yourself, but to help other people. The second course is how to read the Bible for all it's worth. Uh, it's important to get the Word of God to direct us. Your compass in life is the Word of God. The Bible says that His Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. And I'm so glad that this church, Life Church, is a giving church. And Life Child, this last few weeks, have been doing some amazing stuff. Uh, and the Hope 2020 campaign has been so amazing, so awesome. And children's and families' lives have been changed. And we've been able to help so many communities. Watch this video and see what Life Child has been up to. Malawi what's happening at the moment due to COVID-19 all the schools have been closed everybody's in panic everybody's is struggling what's gonna happen next I'm home with three children with no money and no food and it's not easy for us I'm struggling now I even lost my job because of this lockdown and the food now is running out and I don't have any hope. We're here in Kosovo and Life Child has a huge presence here in Kosovo, Samora and the Leaks. And it's important for us to be here because the social dysfunction and the community that is in such need here, it's right that we are here. This is where we bring hope. What we're doing is we're giving food parcels in an ongoing way. We go house to house to the house of every student, to the families and be able to help them at this time. It's so important that people stay strong, they keep their faith high. <laughs> On behalf of all of our teams in Mozambique and Malawi and Zimbabwe and right here in South Africa, we want to say a huge thank you to every single person that has given to our Hope 2020 campaign. about bringing hope in a hopeless situation. Thank you for being missional. Thank you for reaching out with us. Thank you for coming with us. Thank you for sending us. Thank you to every person that has given. And we want to encourage you, would you keep giving to Hope 2020 and help us make an impact in the lives of vulnerable children and their families all across Africa. Thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. I really appreciate everything. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, 
What a great church. I love that there's a group of people who really believe, to make, who believe in making the difference with a community of, of vulnerable children, a community of vulnerable families. Thank you, Life Child. Thank you, Life Church, for your, your audacious generosity and for making the difference in this time in which we find ourselves. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for this new series to be busy with. It's called Renew. Uh, we, last week we started with this a most amazing series, but before we get into the teaching and to the Word of God, come on, we're going to worship God today. Give Him our best. Lift our hearts to God. Lift our voices to God. Lift your life to Him and allow God to, to raise you up in this time so that the Bible says that when we lift Him up, He will draw all men to Himself. Worship God with all your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.
was a moment when the sky lit up A flash and light are breaking through When all were lost, he crossed eternity The King of Life was on the move For the dark court Miraculous pray And we forever change Oh, help King Jesus Oh, help the Lord of heaven and earth Oh, help King Jesus 
I don't know if I've ever told you this enough, but I love worship. I, I love being in moments of worship where I just get lost in the atmosphere of what God is doing. When I feel the weight of the Holy Spirit in the room and how every thought, every distraction, every burden, every worry that I've had coming into church can in a moment disappear. And in a moment, I feel exponentially lighter than I was before I stepped into the room. And that's what renewal feels like. That's what refreshing feels like. That's what revitalization feels like. And this morning, we're going to actually talk about that and what it looks like to enter into a new season, refreshed and revitalized, ready to take on the things that God birthed into our hearts before lockdown and even during lockdown. I believe that God is speaking into our hearts right now. Having gone from not allowing your physical space to determine what your faith space is and to being challenged towards strength and courage and to now almost entering into a new life 101, how to rediscover your dreams with a renewed mind and a refreshed heart season. What could our response look like after calamity hits? Well, I'd like to venture into a story and Pastor Anthony uh, referred to it in last week's message about Jairus in Mark 5 verse 21 to 43. And the story goes like this. It's after Jesus returned from across the lake, a huge crowd of people quickly gathered around him on the shoreline. Just then, a man saw that it was Jesus. So he pushed through the crowd and threw himself down at his feet. How often does that happen to Jesus? His name was Jairus, a Jewish official who was in charge of the synagogue. I need you to understand the, the the weight of that statement. He was a Jewish official that looked after the synagogue. Jesus was not accepted by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, by the political positions of the synagogue. Yet here was an official throwing himself at Jesus' feet. Why? He pleaded with Jesus saying over and over, please come with me. My little daughter is at the point of death and she's only 12 years old. Come and lay your hands on her and heal her and she will live. Immediately, Jesus went with him and the huge crowd followed, pressing in on him from all sides. Imagine that. And before he had finished speaking, people arrived from Jairus' house and pushed through the crowd to give Jairus the news. Remember this, Jairus pushed through a crowd to get to Jesus to give him the news. And now Jairus's friends coming from his home pushed through the crowd again to get to Jesus and to get to Jairus. And it's, they said, there's no need to trouble the master any longer. Your daughter has died. Now, how does this link to us as individuals in lockdown? How does this link to us as people, not necessarily that have had children that are about to pass away, but it links to us and is referenced to us because there are a lot of things in our lives that we have given birth to, that we have taken the responsibility of creating, that we have dreamed about, that we have imagined. And we've seen come into fruition into this world and we've seen it grow and we've nurtured it and we've invested into it. And, and during this period of lockdown and during moments of calamity, we see these things that we've invested into for so long slowly deteriorate and wither away to a point of nothing. We've seen during this lockdown period businesses that have been around for decades all of a sudden having to close doors for the last time because of no more finances. We've seen dreams dissipate and, and dissolve. And this is what I'm making a reference to is Jairus is urgently seeking Jesus to, for, for Jesus to do a miracle in his daughter's life and the thing that he created, the thing that he gave birth to. And irrespective of his position, irrespective of his spiritual or religious alignment, he knows that Jesus is the one that can perform the miracle. And therefore, he throws himself down at Jesus' feet, not worrying about anybody else's judgment, not worrying about what his peers might be thinking, only worrying about what is happening to his daughter and what Jesus can do. And so he throws himself at Jesus' feet and he pleads and he begs. And then two of his friends, two officials from his house come and say, don't worry, she's dead. How often have we seen things in our lives wither away dreams and businesses and, and, and provision and, and 
certain voices come into our lives, whether it be friends, peers, family, and they say, don't worry about that thing. You know, you'll get another chance. Don't give up. Or they're kind of saying, listen, just accept that it is and just move on. And in our heart of hearts, we know that we don't want to move on. And so there's these voices that tell us that what we have given birth to is dying. And I've got to ask us this question. Just as Jairus has these people in his house, just as Jairus has these voices in his head determining his levels of faith, determining his levels of expectation, telling him the bad news before it's already hit, how often do we have voices in our house? So I've got to ask, who is in your house? Often we, resp- uh, we respond, could be determined by our opinion of what happened. Often a negative disposition produces a negative response. Jairus could have seen his daughter dying, so therefore he would have already assumed that she's going to die. We often see things already dying, so we assume that there's no hope. Our ability to dream again as we're stepping into this new season of renewal and refreshment and revitalization, our ability to dream again, to get back on the treadmill of life, is influenced by our present and our past perspectives, which is often shaped by Unfortunately, the people around us sometimes. See, Jairus' friends come upon him and say, your daughter is dead, don't worry. But I've got to ask you this question in the midst of this because Jesus gets to the, gets to the house and in the midst of the chaos, you see people are already mourning, they are weeping. How often do your friends weep and mourn before, before something has happened in your life? But I want to say, what does Jesus say about what your position is? What does Jesus say about your faith position and your hope position and your expectation? Well, I want to read the next part of the scripture and it says this, but Jesus refused to listen to what they were told and said to the Jewish official, don't yield to fear. All you need to do is keep on believing. So they left for his home. But Jesus didn't allow anyone to go with them except Peter and the two brothers, Jacob and John. When they arrived at the home of the synagogue ruler, they encountered a noisy uproar from the people for they were all weeping and wailing. They were already mourning. And upon entering the house, Jesus said to them, Why all this grief and weeping? Don't you know the girl is not dead, but merely asleep? How incredible is that, that his friends came. He thought that his child was going to die. His friends came and said, your child is already dead. Yet Jesus' perspective isn't about death, but it's just saying your dreams are asleep. What you've created, what you've given birth to is asleep. And I want you to notice something here in this next response. I want you to notice the pessimists. When God's word comes into a situation, when a moment of encouragement comes into a situation, when a prophetic word is spoken over your life and your business, over your family, when your hope hope uh, expectations have risen and been raised by your peers around you that you want to speak into your life, all of a sudden, the pessimists come in. And the Bible says, then everyone began to ridicule and make fun of him. Not just Jairus, but of what Jesus was saying, because they had never seen something like this before. Often people will ridicule what they don't know. Often people will ridicule what they haven't experienced. Often people will ridicule outside of their position and outside of their own comprehension and imagination. So often we allow the most destructive voices to determine our actions and our dreams. People will often have an opinion about your dream that pokes fun at it or is negative and we'll actually listen to it. How often is that even though there's 10 positive voices around us, the one voice that actually affects us is actually the negative voice that is screeching louder than the rest. Well, I love Jesus' response moving forward, but we'll get to that now. We'll listen to it and our dreams will almost die before they've even taken flight. You know that as a business owner, if you start a business, your business will only truly break even after a three-year mark. There's actually statistically a fact about the fact or about the reason that your business will only grow to break even within three years. The test and the acid test of whether your, your, your business will survive beyond a point is whether it can even last three years. 
So your dream hasn't even taken flight yet. Your, your dream has even barely even birthed a leaf or a seed. It's, it's not even getting there yet. Yet people are already dismissing it as a failure. But I've got to ask this. They weren't the ones that birthed the passion in your hearts. God was. They weren't the ones that knit us together with the ability to fulfill those dreams, with the, 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 the ability and the talents and the giftings to see those seeds that God has planted in our lives to come to fruition. They weren't the ones. God was. So why do we hold our opinion, their opinion, at an equal or higher level than that of God and His Word? Notice what Jesus does in this passage. He says, but He threw them all outside. I love that. There's no hesitation. There, there's, there's no wait and let me think about it. Jesus heard the negative voices. He heard the pessimists and he threw them outside. And I can't imagine he did it any gently because if, if, if Jesus' passion is anything to go by, he turned the tables over in the synagogue when people were using it for the incorrect reasons. He brought out a cat of nine tails whip and started going at the tables. So I can't imagine Jesus' response was any different to that. He threw them all outside because it wasn't what he promised. It wasn't what he created. And we've got to have the same vigor. We've got to have the same passion. And then he took the child's father and mother and his three disciples and went into the room where the girl was lying. And he tenderly clasped the child's hand in his and said to her in Aramaic, Talitha Kwam, which means little girl, wake up from the sleep of death. And instantly, the 12-year-old girl sat up, stood to her feet, and started walking around the room. Everyone was overcome with astonishment in seeing this miracle. I love that. First of all, the little girl didn't wake up slowly. No, instantly she was up. I believe that when we bring Jesus into the situation, when we address the people that are in our house and the ones that aren't meant to be there, we shove out like we're meant to, and we bring in the people that are meant to be there that are going to encourage us and bring us positivity and build us up. And so iron sharpens iron so man shapes a man will build into our hearts and our minds as we kick those things out and we bring Jesus into the room I believe that revival and resuscitation and restoration and revitalization comes into our spirit and allows us to breathe again and to dream again and to see the possibilities that were never there before because our lenses of hope have changed because that child instantly rose up again. Wouldn't you like to kick some of your thoughts and some of the voices in your head out of the room? Because I've got to show you what happens here. See, Jesus took the ones that gave birth to the girl, the mom and the dad, the originals, and he took the ones who carried the faith, his disciples, into the room to pray. But he left the rest behind. There are going to be seasons in our lives that where our best friends will often say the incorrect things. Why else would Jesus have heard Simon Peter's words and said, get behind me, Satan? Because sometimes we have to rebuke the spirits, even within our friends. Sometimes we have to rebuke the words that aren't godly, that aren't biblical, that aren't in line with his word. Sometimes we have to realize that our position and our perspective shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be shaped by the things that happened in the past or the things that are happening in the present or the, by the people that are around us. Be, we have to allow our opinions and our heart and our mind to be shaped by the Word of God and the position of, Holy, of His Holy Spirit in our lives. And this is the next section that I want to get to because it's the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And it goes like this. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. It's in John 4. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. Surprised, she said, Why would a Jewish man ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? You've got to understand the context in that Jewish people and Samaritans didn't mix. Jesus was a man, she was a woman, that didn't mix. So the expectation that Jesus was going to allow someone that wasn't Jewish, the expectation that Jesus was going to allow someone that was considered really to be filthy and rebellious to give him water, blew her mind, blew her expectation, completely threw her perspective out of the water. And Jesus replied, If only 
you knew who I am and the gift that God wants to give you. I need, I need to say that to you again and you need to hear it with a different ear and with a different heart and with a different mind in the context of your life right now, irrespective of if you've lost your income, if you've lost a portion of your income, if you've lost a business, if you've lost a family member, I need you to listen to this again because your thoughts are about to be changed. If only you knew who I am and the gift that God wants to give you, You'd ask me for a drink, and I would give to you living water. And see her response here, because she's still stuck in her past perspective. And she says, do you really think that you are greater than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it himself, along with his children and his livestock? Can you see how she is still stuck in her past? Can you see how she's still stuck in her history? Can you see how she is still stuck in her offense? Can you see how she is still stuck in her limited mindset? She is still stuck in her physical space instead of living large in her faith space. Because I guarantee you, if she knew who Jesus was in that time, who she did later, her faith space would not have been determined by her physical space, but it would have been greater. She would have been able to be strong and courageous, and she would have been able to have her dream lenses and her her perspective changed according to who was in front of her. And Jesus answered, if you drink from Jacob's well, you'll be thirsty again and again. And I believe again and again and again and again and again and again. I think we often do that. And how often we're left, we're left hopeless. How often we are left anxious. How often we are left stressful. How often we are left complacent. How often we are left tired because we've been drinking from the wrong well. We've been drinking from our history. We've been drinking from our experience. We've been drinking from our wisdom. We've been drinking from our, only, our, our own imagination. But get what Jesus says here. But if anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never thirst again. How beautiful statement is that? But if anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never thirst again. And I will be and you will be forever satisfied. For when you drink the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit, springing up and flooding you with endless life, with endless hope, with endless provision, with endless energy and revitalization of spirit. See, see, I can go and do sports. I I love refreshing myself by going to go play soccer. And often in, in one hour of soccer, I will get 20,000 steps in and my heart will be racing to 100, 180 beats per minute. And when Megan comes and picks me up from the soccer field, my face will be pale and purple all at the same time. And she will look at me and she'll say, Bruce, did you do it again? And I would look at, all with, look at her with the last bit of energy that I have in my life. And I would say, yeah, because I love it. And just even though I'm physically tired, spiritually, I'm so ready to take on my new challenge. I am ready to get up and walk again. I'm ready to take on another giant. But the thing that takes me to the next level outside of that of my refreshment is including Jesus in the room, bringing the Holy Spirit into the picture. Because when the Holy Spirit enters the picture, it becomes a gushing fountain springing up and flooding you with endless life. And this is why I love this next passage of Scripture so much where Pastor Ant referenced last week in Isaiah 43, 18, verse 19, where it says, Stop dwelling on the past. Stop dwelling on what you've done before. Stop dwelling on the abilities that you've done to create certain things in the past. Stop dwelling on your degree because you don't even have that degree anymore because you're doing something completely different to what that degree even is. Stop dwelling on your talent. Stop dwelling on your own intelligence. Stop dwelling on your particular status right now or the things that you're in. Stop dwelling on your past. Don't even remember those former things. Because I'm about to do something brand new, something unheard of. I love in the fact when, when people come and approach Jesus and say, follow me, Jesus says, well, go to those things and say farewell. Go to those things and say goodbye. For I supply streams of water in the desert and rivers in the wilderness to satisfy the thirst of my people, my chosen ones, so that you whom I have shaped and formed myself, will proclaim my praise. I love it. God is anything but inconsistent with his responses. 
If we looked at even the whole entire Bible story, the whole entire story of the Bible is about God's redemptive work of creating man with a hope and expectation, with a dream, seeing them move away, seeing them backslide from him, him running after them, creating a place where they can receive atonement, them having a moment of peace and community and fellowship with God, and then they drift away. And so the routine repeats itself throughout history, even to today, where we see atrocious things happening in the world. But each and every single time, God comes along and says, I'm about to do a new thing. I'm about to give you a new stream of water. I believe that in the midst of some of the things that we have seen fade away in our lives, they haven't necessarily died, but they just need a bit of new life in them. They just need a bit of new water. They just need a bit of a stream that is not our own, but is on God's side, that is God's pure and created. Because check this out. In Philippians 2 verse 12 and 13, I've quoted the scripture so many times, but it says, continue to work out your salvation. That is cultivated, bring it to full effect, actively pursue spiritual maturity with awe-inspired fear and trembling. And then in passage 13, it says, for it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work within you, both to will and to work. That is to strengthen, energize, creating you, in, uh, creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose. See, as we take responsibility for our things, as we step up and try to dream and imagine, and we invite God to, into the situation, and we invite God into the household, and we invite His Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us and refresh us and revitalize us, as we position ourselves in His presence, our ability to work out our salvation, work out the calling and the purpose and the gifting and the blessings in our lives. As we start to work out those things, He intercedes and He makes sense of it all. He gives us discernment and wisdom into those things that we have been pursuing. Because the Bible is very clear about this next section in Isaiah 40, 31. where God has continuously spoken about our works, the things that we have responsibility for. And when we go through trials and when we go through tribulations and when we go through hard times and persecution, and whatever that might look like, that as long as we continue to press into Him, as long as we continue to work out our salvation and reach up to Him, that God is going to work because it says in Isaiah 40, 31, but those who trust in the Lord, those who place their reliance, those who rest on Him, those who lean on Him, those who are aware of Him and, and believe in what He can do, just like Jairus threw himself at Jesus' feet because Jairus knew what Jesus could do. He had a reputation and beyond his perspective, beyond his own wisdom, he knew that if he submitted and surrendered the situation to Jesus, that Jesus would break through. But those who trust in the Lord will not renew their strength. Those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. Not the strength that you had. Not the strength that you've experienced, but you will experience new strength. And that new strength will cause you to soar high on wings like eagles. Soar above your problems. Soar above your present situations to get a perspective of what God is doing. And they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. What happens when we bring Jesus into the house? What happens when we bring Jesus into the room? When calamity strikes, when things get hard, when things get tough, when you have no energy, when you have nothing that's refreshing you, when everything is a burden to you, when everything feels like a weight, when everything is stressful, when everything causes anxiety, what do we do? And I had a friend of mine whose mom many years ago, she was an incredible woman. She was a godly woman. She loved Jesus. She believed in Him. She committed her life to Him. And one morning she woke up and she had the most ferocious stroke I've ever heard of. And she went through a period of mourning. But then at that moment or at a certain moment, she threw those voices of mourning out of the room. And she brought Jesus in. And each and every single day as she walked, as she tried, she would bring God's word and God's encouragement into her room, into her situation. And slowly, the, the, the movements on her fingers, on her left hand side, began to go. And, and slowly, her feet began to move. And slowly, she could get a walk again. And slowly, she could talk with correct linguistics again. And slowly, and slowly, and slowly, until now today, you can't even see a speck of the mark of the stroke on her 
Well, it was because she allowed Jesus to come into the room. She threw out the voices that weren't meant to be there and she brought God's truth and she brought God's encouragement. She brought God's faith into the situation. And so she allowed herself to begin to dream again and be refreshed by his presence, be revitalized by his word. See, in closing, in your calamity, bring Jesus back into your room. Invigorate your spirit one more time. I I know that we've been going through hard times. I know that there's been over a million jobs lost in our country and that some of you are those. I know that some of us have lost, lost loved ones and I know that's incredibly hard, but I know that when we bring Jesus into the room, when we throw ourselves at his feet and cry out to him that he will respond in love and in grace and in truth because he doesn't want us to hear those voices. He wants us to hear his heart. The heart that says, I love you. The heart that says, I want to protect you. The heart that says, I want to walk with you. The heart that says, I created you. The heart that says, I know you. The heart that says, I believe in you. The heart that says, I have faith in you. The heart that says, here, take something. I'm committing this to you. That heart that wants community with you because he loves you. He doesn't enjoy the fact that you cry. He doesn't enjoy the fact that you mourn. He doesn't enjoy the fact that you struggle. And all he desires, his greatest heart's desire is that you just lean your heart to him. Because at his feet there is perfect presence or there's perfect peace. So I want to encourage us today. We're in this new theme of renewal. And Pastor Ann spoke about rediscovery and this health check and that was great. I I believe in that. And I want to take us on that next journey of saying, well, how do we get refreshed so that we aren't being weighed down by the other voices that aren't meant to be there, but we are being lifted up and encouraged and rejuvenated and being revitalized and being asked to dream and imagine again because we have allowed Jesus back into the room. It's time to open your door. If you're with us today and you've never given your life to Jesus and you find yourself struggling, wondering, questioning, why God, oh why, well, I know that when we give our lives to Jesus, that he has every single answer that we need if we would just lean and commit our hearts to him. Because he is a father and he is a savior and he is a redeemer in every context. So if you want to give your life to Jesus today, just close your eyes right now and I'll pray with you. Jesus, I thank you that you love me and I thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. That you died so that I would never have to experience shame or hopelessness again but so that I can have an abundance of hope and expectation for the future, that I can run my race with confidence, knowing that you are running right beside me, that you are running ahead of me, and you are running behind me. Father God, Jesus, would you come into my heart today? Would you take over my life? Would you fill me with a new spirit and rejuvenate and refresh me and give me a new hope and a new expectation and a new strength? I commit my life to you in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. If that was you today, you've made the greatest decision you could ever make. And I want to encourage you, please let us know so that we can give you the next steps on what you can do in this incredible journey called being a Jesus follower. So email us at info at life church and we'd love to get back in touch with you. But for the rest of you, we're going to enter up into worship right now. I want you to raise your hands up to our Jesus that loves us. Bring him into the room of our situation. And let's begin to change the voice that's sitting in our shoulders. Come on. Hi, family. I would like to encourage you from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verse 21. It says, See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your fathers, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. You know, we remember that God had promised the Israelites that he will take them out of Egypt to Canaan. And when there was time for them to enter into Canaan, the Lord said through Moses, 
tell the people to go up and take possession of the land. However, the people did not go in. The people did not take possession. Instead, they wanted to send spies so that they will see how the land looks like, so that they will do their own planning and their own strategies. I would like to encourage you today to renew and revive your trust and reliance on God. Here the Lord says, don't be afraid. But the Israelites, after the spies have went in and they came back after 40 days with a negative report, uh, 10 came with a negative report, 2 came with a positive report. They decided to listen to the negative report. And by so doing, they were dismayed, they were afraid. They forgot the Lord who provided them with manna, the Lord who opened the Red Sea. They forgot the Lord who brought the pillar of cloud and the fire. They forgot all those things. They looked upon their strength and their abilities. They did not renew their confidence. They did not renew and revive their trust in God. And because of that, the Lord then said, for the 40 days that you have spent spying the land, it will be one is to one. In other words, one day will be equivalent to one year. So you will spend 40 years in the wilderness without entering the promised land. In other words, their lack of trust and their lack of faith in God resulted in them spending 40 years in the wilderness. It was never God's plan for the Israelites to spend 40 years in the wilderness. His plan was to take them to the promised land, but they failed to revive their confidence, their trust, and their faith in God. And as you are about to give, I would like to encourage you today that that which the Lord lays in your heart, rely on God, trust Him. Of course, all of us have taken a knock because of COVID-19. Our finances have taken a knock, but do not allow your faith to take a knock. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you are alive, that you want us to rely on you, Lord. And so today we are saying we want to rely on you even with our finances, with everything that we are. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And so the details are appearing on the screen. Uh, you can give via Snapscan or uh, you can do your EFT to Life Church Cape Town or Life Church Pretoria, or you can write to us if you need more information about giving to Life Church Zimbabwe. May the Lord bless you as we as we give, and let's go back to to fellowship and worshiping the Lord together. Amen. Be blessed.
amazing day today. Great worship. Great word from Pastor Bruce. I have been so challenged by the word of God today. And I'm challenged to allow God to do the things that he has planned for my life, for him to lead me in this day. And with that in mind, I want to encourage you to remember to sign on for Life Academy. Register your, for this term three and register for these sessions that are coming up. Get yourself equipped, inspired for all the new things that God has for you. And thank you for giving to Life Church today. Thank you for your donations. Thank you for your tithes and your offerings. You guys are absolutely amazing because you believe in what God is doing through this church and through Life Child. Thank you for your generosity. So be strong. Remember to do the things that God has for you. And if you've got any questions, anything about Life Church and Life Child, you can write to us at info at life-church.co.za and somebody will get back to you and make sure that you get all your questions answered. But hey, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you raise your, raise your hands now as, we, as, as I share the benediction with you? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you until Jesus comes where he will rule and reign for all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. From the depths you have raised me To a high I have never seen Oh, you saw what I could be And now I know I'll never be the same